Part four of Joseph Haydn, Servant and Master by Herbert F. Pazer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Haydn was the wrong teacher for Beethoven, and Beethoven the wrong pupil for Haydn. The young man's relations with the old master were kind and friendly. Beethoven, according to his diaries, treated Haydn to chocolate twenty-two times, and to coffee six times. But there was a spiritual gulf between them of which they both became aware. Haydn, indeed, foreshadowed musical romanticism, yet he did not, like his new pupil, arrogantly identify himself with it. Beethoven had none of that soul of a servitor which Haydn had acquired through his long career, so it was not without reason that the teacher used to allude to the hot-headed pupil as the Grand Mogul. Moreover, Beethoven wanted to be instructed in counterpoint the hard way, and he was greatly irritated when Haydn did not carefully correct his technical exercises. Therefore, though the relationship remained outwardly amicable, and the lessons went on, Beethoven changed teachers. He placed himself in the hands of the composer Johann Schenk and of the contrapuntalist Johann Albrechtsberger. As Schenk had told Beethoven in looking over some of his technical work, Haydn was now too busy composing great masterworks to be occupied by the needs of a particularly obstreperous student. In 1794 Haydn started out a second time for London, but this time not in Salomon's company. Yet as he did not wish to make the journey unattended, he decided on one of his young friends for an escort, Polzelli, Beethoven, or some other. His usual luck attended him when he picked Johann Elsler, whose father had copied music at Esterhaza. Johann was Haydn's godson, and in the fullness of time he became the father of the famous dancer Fanny Elsler. He idolized Haydn, served him hand and foot, was secretary, copyist, and the first to assist Haydn in cataloging his works. On this English visit Haydn travelled rather more extensively than the first time. He went to the Isle of Wight, to Southampton, to Waverley Abbey, to Winchester. He went to Hampton Court, which reminded him of Esterhaza. He heard miserable trash at the Haymarket Theatre, and even worse at Sadler's Wells. In Bath he met a Miss Brown, an amiable, discreet person, who had the additional advantage of a beautiful mother. He saw the grave of Turk, a faithful dog and not a man, and he composed music to a poem by the conductor of the Bath Harmonic Society, What Art Expresses. In August 1795 Haydn was back in Vienna, and although the heartbreaks of the previous return were spared him, he found plenty of new organizational labor awaiting him at Esterhaza, where a new prince, Nicholas II, a grandson of the Magnificent, now held sway. His artistic tastes, though pronounced, did not run primarily in the direction of music. He gave Carabini a gorgeous and costly ring. He liked the music of Reuter and Michael Haydn more than that of the great Esterhazy Kapellmeister, and then insulted Beethoven with a stupid remark about the latter's C major mass. He even criticized Haydn's management of some detail at an orchestral rehearsal, whereupon the now thoroughly irascible master turned on his patron with a wrathy, Your Highness, it is my job to decide this. He felt now that a doctor of music at Oxford should be addressed more respectfully than simply as Haydn. In London, the composer once said, I want to write a work which will give permanent fame to my name in the world. After his numerous symphonies, his masses, his clavier works, his vast store of chamber music, his concertos, his operatic miscellany, his songs and arias, after all these what could remain? England had given him one unrivaled experience from which he could nourish his genius, the mighty Handel commemoration in Westminster Abbey. Haydn had experimented in countless forms but one. That was the oratorio, and in this he could undertake new flights. Where should he find a subject? Some say that a musical friend of Haydn's answered the master by opening a Bible standing handy and exclaiming, There! Take that, and begin at the beginning. Others maintain that Salomon gave him a libretto which one Lidley had pieced together from Milton's Paradise Lost for Handel. 
Dr. Geiringer believes that both accounts may be true. At all events, Haydn returned to Vienna with the text. It was, however, in English, which Haydn understood imperfectly. It was necessary, consequently, to find an accomplished translator. As usual, good fortune attended him. Gottfried von Schwieten, a literateur, prefect of the Vienna Royal Library, friend of Mozart, worshipper of Handel and Bach, who thought highly of Haydn, was wealthy even if despotic, yet still after a fashion musical this man was able to furnish haydn what he required nay more he got together a group of twelve music-loving noblemen and each guaranteed a contribution to defray the expense of performance and pay an honorarium to the composer and haydn set jubilantly and withal reverently to work he spent much time over it because he intended it to last a long time the labor gave him extraordinary happiness it answered his inmost wants. Here he could give the freest possible rein to all that inborn optimism of his nature. Always profoundly religious, as free from doubt and skepticism as a child, his reverence was as sincere as it was sunny. Here he walked literally hand in hand with his God. There came to the surface, moreover, all those springs of folk-song influence which were either remembered or subconsciously wrought into the fabric of his being, and he was now working on a newer and larger scale than hitherto. Never was I so devout as when composing the creation, he afterwards said. I knelt down every day and prayed to God to strengthen me in my work. If his inspiration ever threatened to grow sluggish, I rose from the pianoforte and began to say my rosary. This cure, he insisted, never failed. The curious aspect of the creation is that, though composed to a German translation of the English text, it is one of those rare masterpieces which actually sound better in a translation than in the original. The answer to this springs probably from the circumstance that the creation is, in point of fact, an anglo-saxon heritage an examination of numerous details of its setting and declamation make it clear that almost subconsciously haydn has set and accompanied the english words in more subtly revealing fashion than the german similarly haydn achieved in the whole work that effect at which he was aiming writing to her daughter the princess eleanor liechtenstein said of the oratorio one has to shed tears about the greatness the majesty the goodness of god the soul is uplifted one cannot but love and admire the first performance of the creation was given at the palace of prince schwarzenberg in vienna on april twenty ninth seventeen ninety eight only invited guests attended this and the second performance, though the mobs outside were so great that extra detachments of police had to be summoned. Haydn conducted, not from a keyboard, but in the modern way, with a baton. The rendering was superb, the audience enraptured. Haydn himself said later, One moment I was as cold as ice, the next I seemed on fire. More than once I was afraid I should have a stroke the creation promptly spread over the world in england it was to prove so unfailing an attraction that proceeds from it mostly given to charitable institutions by far surpassed even the receipts from the london benefit concerts that once had seemed so extraordinary to haydn in paris bonaparte was on his way to hear a performance of it when a bomb exploded in the street through which he was passing narrowly missing his carriage in America it took root in short order. The score deserves in reality a much more detailed scrutiny than can be given here. The introduction, the representation of chaos, does not receive the attention it actually merits. There is a warmth of color to the writing, particularly to the woodwind, which is something new in Haydn and the closing bars of the amazing page are the more startling because they provide a foretaste of one of the most striking passages in wagner's tristan und isolde it may be mentioned in passing that this is by no means the only time when haydn affords an amazing wagnerian presage the great and even more celebrated moment in the opening choral number of the oratorio is the passage let there be light and there was light 
from a thin gray c minor we are suddenly overwhelmed with a sudden and mighty c major chord an unmistakable sunburst in tone in all music this tremendous moment has not its like unless it be a similar episode also a sunrise and by curiously related means at the opening of richard strauss's thus spake zarathustra from the very first this moment in the creation overpowered the listeners and after a century and a half it has lost not a vestige of its glory at his last appearance in a concert hall haydn only a few weeks from his end was taken to a performance of his work at this episode the old master pointed upwards with the words not from me from there above comes everything the strain of unending toil was beginning to tell on haydn though the amazing aspect of it is that these latest works of his do not betray the slightest diminution of freshness or inventive powers yet on june twelfth seventeen ninety nine he wrote to breitkopf and hertel a letter which deserves attention my business unhappily expands with my advancing years and it almost seems as if with the decrease of my mental powers my inclination and impulse to work increase o oh god how much yet remains to be done in this splendid art even by a man like myself the world indeed daily pays me many compliments even on the fervour of my latest works but no one can believe the strain and effort it costs me to produce them inasmuch as time after time my feeble memory and the unstrung state of my nerves so completely crush me to earth that i fall into the most melancholy condition for days afterwards i am incapable of formulating one single idea till at length my heart is revived by providence and i seat myself at the piano and begin once more to hammer away at it then all goes well again god be praised i only wish and hope that the critics may not handle my creation with too great severity and be too hard on it they may possibly find the musical orthography faulty in various passages and perhaps other things also which for many years i have been accustomed to consider as minor points but the genuine connoisseur will see the real cause as readily as i do and willingly ignore such stumbling blocks this however is entirely entre nous or i might be accused of conceit and arrogance from which however my heavenly father has preserved me all my life long haydn had still a prodigious amount of work before him chief of all was another full-length oratorio the seasons based on james thompson's didactic poem here again the baron von schwieten edited and translated though he made use of several german poems in addition to thompson's of which he altered the unhappy ending the composer worked for three years on the seasons not completing it until eighteen o one it seems to have tested his power sorely it was no less optimistic a document than the creation but by and large an outspoken nature piece conceived in rousseau's back to nature philosophy yet with only transient religious undertones and without the genuinely biblical quality of the creation still the truly amazing part of the seasons is its incessant vitality the charm of its pictorial aspect and the unending freshness of its inspiration all the same the magnificent work made unmistakable inroads on haydn's vitality he paid for its success with his health and was in the habit of saying from now on the seasons has given me the death blow actually he had suffered a physical breakdown of a sort shortly after one of the productions of the creation he had to take to his bed and intermittently the flow of his inspiration threatened to halt but invariably he would recover both physically and mentally he revised his earlier seven last words as an oratorio he arranged two hundred and fifty scotch folk songs for the edinburgh publisher george thompson the number of his string quartets increased performances of the creation multiplied everywhere honors poured in upon him from all quarters he was warmly invited to come to paris and his old pupil pleyel was dispatched to fetch him fortunately haydn spared himself the exertions of such a trip 
Still, France struck a medal in his honor, which gave the master no end of pleasure, and he received the warmest expressions of affection from the inhabitants of the little Baltic island of Rügen, where a performance of the creation was given. He even strove to be his own publisher, and sought subscriptions for the score of the oratorio. His friends rallied magnificently to his aid. The English royal family, the Empress of Austria, the innumerable friends from his native country, and from Britain, England as much as Austria, now claimed him as one of her very own. Lord Nelson and Lady Hamilton visited Esterhaza, and it is said that for two days the lady would not budge from Haydn's side, while Nelson gave him a gold watch in exchange for the master's pen. The great composition of this later period of Haydn's life is beyond dispute his patriotic anthem, Gott erhalte Franz den Kaiser, the Austrian hymn, as through thick and thin it has remained. That, too, was indirectly a product of his English experiences. He had always been stirred in London by God save the King, and it became his ambition to provide something similar for his own nation. The great melody that resulted bears a distinct resemblance to a Croatian folk song of the Eisenstadt region, Zalosna Zaruchnika, which certain musicologists maintain served as the inspiration for Haydn's melody, though the derivation has not been definitely established. But others than Austrians have made the song their own. The Germans, for instance, consorted it to a poem by Hoffmann von Feversleben, and thereby it became Deutschland über alles. The English-speaking nations put it to churchly uses and made it the hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. While he was still engaged in exacting creative work, he set a schedule for himself which he appears to have followed rigorously. A daily plan of activities, written by Elzer, Dr. Geiringer surmises, furnishes a picture of Herr von Haydn's routine. He was living in a house he had bought in the Gumpendorfer district of Vienna. We read that in the summer time he rose at 6.30 a.m., First he shaved, which he did for himself up to his seventy-third year, and then he completed dressing. If a pupil were present, he had to play his lesson on the piano to Herr von Haydn while the master dressed. All mistakes were promptly corrected, and a new task was set. This occupied an hour and a half. At eight o'clock sharp, breakfast had to be on the table, and immediately after breakfast Haydn sat down at the piano, improvising and drafting sketches of some composition. From eight o'clock to eleven-thirty his time was taken up in this way. At eleven-thirty calls were received or made, or he went for a walk until one-thirty. The hour from two to three was reserved for dinner, after which Haydn immediately did some little work in the house, or resumed his musical occupations. He scored the morning sketches, devoting three to four hours to this. At 8 p.m. Haydn usually went out, and at 9 he came home and sat down to write a score, or he took a book and read until 10 p.m. At that time he had supper, which consisted of bread and wine. Haydn made a rule of eating nothing but bread and wine at night, and infringed it only on sundry occasions when he was invited to supper. He liked gay conversation and some merry entertainment at the table. At eleven-thirty he went to bed, in his old age, even later. Winter time made no difference to the schedule, except that Haydn got up half an hour later. But despite this pleasant and comfortable routine, Haydn was now beginning to age rapidly. On December 26, 1803, he conducted for the last time, and characteristically for a hospital fund, the work he directed being the seven last words. He wrote two movements of a string quartet, but by 1806 he had given up all idea of finishing it, and as a conclusion added a few bars of a song he had written in the past few years, Der Greis, which begins, Hin ist alle meine Kraft, Alt und schwach bin ich. Gone is all my strength, old and weak am I. Friends and admirers in ever-increasing numbers sought him out to pay their respects. There came Carabini, the Abbe Vogler, the violinist Bayot, 
Lyell, members of the Weber family, Madame Bijot, a friend of Beethoven, and afterwards one of the piano teachers of Felix and Fanny Mendelssohn, Hummel, the widow of Mozart, the Princess Esterhazy, the actor Iffland. In 1805 a rumor gained currency that Haydn had died. The world was shocked. Carabini even composed a cantata on Haydn's passing, Kreutzer a violin concerto based on themes from Haydn's works, while in Paris a special memorial concert was arranged and Mozart's requiem was to be given. Suddenly there came a letter from the master saying that he was still of this base world, and he thanked his French admirers for their well-meant gestures, adding, had I only known of it in time, I would have traveled to Paris to conduct the requiem myself. Johann Wenzel Tomacek told how Haydn greeted any visitor who might drop in. He sat in an armchair very much dressed up, a powdered wig with side locks, a white neckband with a bold buckle, a white richly embroidered waistcoat of heavy silk, in the midst of which shone a splendid jabot, a dress of fine coffee-colored cloth with embroidered cuffs, black silk breeches, white silk hose, shoes with large silver buckles curved over the instep, and on a little table next to him a pair of white kid gloves made up his attire. He made one last public appearance. It was at a performance of the creation given at the Vienna University in celebration of the master's seventy-sixth birthday. About the only person of prominence not present was Prince Esterhazy, but he at least sent his carriage to bring the master to the concert. At the hall were assembled not alone the high nobility, but all the most distinguished musicians of the capital, among them Beethoven, Salieri, Hummel, Geiritz. Salieri conducted. The concertmaster was Franz Clement, for whom Beethoven wrote his violin concerto. The French ambassador, seeing Haydn wearing the gold medal of the Parisian Concert des Amateurs, exclaimed, This medal is not enough. You should receive all the medals that France can distribute. The Princess Esterhazy not only sat next to the master, but wrapped her own shawl about him. It was on this occasion that Haydn made his historic remark, when the audience burst into applause at the sublime passage, and there was light. As the concert progressed, he became visibly excited, and it was thought advisable to take him home. As Haydn left the auditorium, Beethoven knelt down before him and reverently kissed his hand and brow. Before the old man finally vanished from view, he turned one last time and lifted his hand in blessing on the assemblage. By the spring of 1809 the Napoleonic Wars were again devastating Austria. The bombardment of the western suburbs of Vienna brought the battle uncomfortably close to Haydn's home. Nevertheless, the master refused to leave, and when a bomb fell close to the Gumpendorfer house, the old man reassured his frightened servants with the words, "'Children, don't be frightened. Where Haydn is, nothing can happen to you.' but the continuous noise and excitement shook the invalid's nerves so severely that he took to his bed and left it only once. This was to be carried to his piano, there to play three times in succession, and with the deepest possible feeling, his own Austrian hymn, as if to defy those hostile powers unwilling to let him die in peace. On the same day, however, he was visited by a French officer, Clément Soulemé, who called to pay his respects to the composer of the creation, and who, before he left, sat down at the piano and sang the aria in native worth in so manly and sublime a style, with so much truth of expression and musical sentiment, that Haydn embraced him and said he had never heard the air delivered in so masterly a fashion. Sulemé fell in battle the same day, a fact which the composer fortunately never learned. But his strength was now quite gone. He could only whisper to those about him, "'Children, be comforted. I am well.' Then he lapsed into unconsciousness, and shortly after midnight, May 31, 1809, he passed. Napoleon saw to it that a military guard of honor was stationed at his door." At his obsequies, not only the cultural world of Vienna, but also the highest French military officials were present, and Mozart's Requiem was sung. 
the story cannot be ended without an allusion to its macabre epilogue haydn was laid to rest in the hundstorm cemetery but soon afterwards prince esterhazy received permission to reinter the master in eisenstadt there were lengthy delays however and in eighteen fourteen sigismund neukamm was shocked to find the tomb in a state of dilapidation he placed on it a marble slab with haydn's favorite quotation from horace non omnis moriar i shall not wholly die set as a five-part canon six years later the duke of cambridge remarked to prince esterhazy how fortunate was the man who employed this haydn in his lifetime and now possesses his mortal remains the prince said nothing but experienced a sharp twinge of conscience so he gave orders for the exhumation and the reburial in the eisenstadt bergkirche where haydn had conducted a number of his masses when the coffin was opened the officials were appalled to find a body without a head it developed that a certain karl rosenbaum once a secretary to prince esterhazy and a penitentiary official one johann peter had bribed the viennese gravedigger to steal the skull which they wanted for phrenological experiments peter had made an elaborate decorated box with windows and a satin cushion for the gruesome relic the outraged prince sent the police to peter who meantime had given the skull to rosenbaum the police were quite as unsuccessful at the rosenbaum house for the singer theresa gaussmann rosenbaum promptly hid the skull in her mattress and went to bed pretending illness the hideous farce went a step further when rosenbaum expecting a bribe substituted the head of some unidentified old man when rosenbaum died he left haydn's skull to peter obligating him to bequeath it to the museum of the society of the friends of music in vienna where it was preserved since eighteen ninety five it was reported that the nazis after the austrian anschluss in nineteen thirty eight proposed to bury the head in haydn's coffin at eisenstadt whether they carried out this plan is not known to the present writer end of part four end of joseph haydn servant and master by herbert f peaser part four of joseph haydn servant and master by herbert f peaser this librivox recording is in the public domain haydn was the wrong teacher for beethoven and beethoven the wrong pupil for haydn the young man's relations with the old master were kind and friendly beethoven according to his diaries treated haydn to chocolate twenty-two times and to coffee six times but there was a spiritual gulf between them of which they both became aware haydn indeed foreshadowed musical romanticism yet he did not like his new pupil arrogantly identify himself with it beethoven had none of that soul of a servitor which haydn had acquired through his long career so it was not without reason that the teacher used to allude to the hot-headed pupil as the grand mogul moreover beethoven wanted to be instructed in counterpoint the hard way and he was greatly irritated when haydn did not carefully correct his technical exercises therefore though the relationship remained outwardly amicable and the lessons went on beethoven changed teachers he placed himself in the hands of the composer johann schenk and of the contrapuntalist johann albrechtsberger as schenk had told beethoven in looking over some of his technical work haydn was now too busy composing great masterworks to be occupied by the needs of a particularly obstreperous student in seventeen ninety four haydn started out a second time for london but this time not in salomon's company yet as he did not wish to make the journey unattended he decided on one of his young friends for an escort Bozzelli, beethoven or some other his usual luck attended him when he picked johann elsler whose father had copied music at esterhaza johann was haydn's godson and in the fullness of time he became the father of the famous dancer fanny elsler he idolized haydn served him hand and foot was secretary copyist and the first to assist haydn in cataloguing his works 
on this english visit haydn travelled rather more extensively than the first time he went to the isle of wight to southampton to waverley abbey to winchester he went to hampton court which reminded him of esterhaza he heard miserable trash at the haymarket theatre and even worse at sadler's wells in bath he met a miss brown an amiable discreet person who had the additional advantage of a beautiful mother he saw the grave of turk a faithful dog and not a man and he composed music to a poem by the conductor of the bath harmonic society what art expresses in august seventeen ninety five haydn was back in vienna and although the heartbreaks of the previous return were spared him he found plenty of new organizational labor awaiting him at esterhaza where a new prince nicholas the second a grandson of the magnificent now held sway his artistic tastes though pronounced did not run primarily in the direction of music he gave Carabini a gorgeous and costly ring he liked the music of reuter and michael haydn more than that of the great esterhazy kapellmeister and then insulted beethoven with a stupid remark about the latter's c major mass he even criticized haydn's management of some detail at an orchestral rehearsal whereupon the now thoroughly irascible master turned on his patron with a wrathy your highness it is my job to decide this he felt now that a doctor of music at oxford should be addressed more respectfully than simply as haydn in london the composer once said i want to write a work which will give permanent fame to my name in the world after his numberless symphonies his masses his clavier works his vast store of chamber music his concertos his operatic miscellany his songs and arias after all these what could remain england had given him one unrivalled experience from which he could nourish his genius the mighty hendel commemoration in westminster abbey haydn had experimented in countless forms but one that was the oratorio and in this he could undertake new flights where should he find a subject some say that a musical friend of haydn's answered the master by opening a bible standing handy and exclaiming there take that and begin at the beginning others maintain that salomon gave him a libretto which one lidley had pieced together from milton's paradise lost for handel dr geiringer believes that both accounts may be true at all events haydn returned to vienna with the text it was however in english which haydn understood imperfectly it was necessary consequently to find an accomplished translator as usual good fortune attended him gottfried von schwieten a literateur prefect of the vienna royal library friend of mozart worshipper of handel and bach who thought highly of haydn was wealthy even if despotic yet still after a fashion musical this man was able to furnish haydn what he required nay more he got together a group of twelve music-loving noblemen and each guaranteed a contribution to defray the expense of performance and pay an honorarium to the composer and haydn set jubilantly and withal reverently to work he spent much time over it because he intended it to last a long time the labor gave him extraordinary happiness it answered his inmost wants here he could give the freest possible rein to all that inborn optimism of his nature always profoundly religious as free from doubt and skepticism as a child his reverence was as sincere as it was sunny here he walked literally hand in hand with his god there came to the surface moreover all those springs of folk-song influence which were either remembered or subconsciously wrought into the fabric of his being and he was now working on a newer and larger scale than hitherto never was i so devout as when composing the creation he afterwards said i knelt down every day and prayed to god to strengthen me in my work if his inspiration ever threatened to grow sluggish i rose from the pianoforte and began to say my rosary this cure he insisted never failed the curious aspect of the creation is that though composed to a german translation of the english text it is one of those rare masterpieces which actually sound better in a translation than in the original 
the answer to this springs probably from the circumstance that the creation is in point of fact an anglo-saxon heritage an examination of numerous details of its setting and declamation make it clear that almost subconsciously haydn has set and accompanied the english words in more subtly revealing fashion than the german similarly haydn achieved in the whole work that effect at which he was aiming writing to her daughter the princess eleanor liechtenstein said of the oratorio one has to shed tears about the greatness the majesty the goodness of god the soul is uplifted one cannot but love and admire the first performance of the creation was given at the palace of prince schwarzenberg in vienna on april twenty ninth seventeen ninety eight only invited guests attended this and the second performance though the mobs outside were so great that extra detachments of police had to be summoned the artistic tastes though pronounced did not run primarily in the direction of music he gave carabini a gorgeous and costly ring he liked the music of reuter and michael haydn more than that of the great esterhazy kapellmeister and then insulted beethoven with a stupid remark about the latter's c major mass he even criticized haydn's management of some detail at an orchestral rehearsal whereupon the now thoroughly irascible master turned on his patron with a wrathy your highness it is my job to decide this he felt now that a doctor of music at Oxford should be addressed more respectfully than simply as Haydn. In London, the composer once said, I want to write a work which will give permanent fame to my name in the world. After his numerous symphonies, his masses, his clavier works, his vast store of chamber music, his concertos, his operatic miscellany, his songs and arias, after all these what could remain? england had given him one unrivalled experience from which he could nourish his genius the mighty hendel commemoration in westminster abbey haydn had experimented in countless forms but one that was the oratorio and in this he could undertake new flights where should he find a subject some say that a musical friend of haydn's answered the master by opening a bible standing handy and exclaiming there take that and begin at the beginning others maintain that salomon gave him a libretto which one lidley had pieced together from milton's paradise lost for handel dr geiringer believes that both accounts may be true at all events haydn returned to vienna with the text it was however in english which haydn understood imperfectly it was necessary consequently to find an accomplished translator as usual good fortune attended him gottfried von schwieten a literateur prefect of the vienna royal library friend of mozart worshipper of handel and bach who thought highly of haydn was wealthy even if despotic yet still after a fashion musical this man was able to furnish haydn what he required nay more he got together a group of twelve music-loving noblemen and each guaranteed a contribution to defray the expense of performance and pay an honorarium to the composer and haydn set jubilantly and withal reverently to work he spent much time over it because he intended it to last a long time the labor gave him extraordinary happiness it answered his inmost wants here he could give the freest possible rein to all that inborn optimism of his nature always profoundly religious as free from doubt and skepticism as a child his reverence was as sincere as it was sunny here he walked literally hand in hand with his god there came to the surface moreover part four of joseph haydn servant and master by herbert f Pazer. this librivox recording is in the public domain haydn was the wrong teacher for beethoven and beethoven the wrong pupil for haydn the young man's relations with the old master were kind and friendly beethoven according to his diaries treated haydn to chocolate twenty-two times and to coffee six times but there was a spiritual gulf between them of which they both became aware haydn indeed foreshadowed musical romanticism yet he did not like his new pupil arrogantly identify himself with it 
beethoven had none of that soul of a servitor which haydn had acquired through his long career so it was not without reason that the teacher used to allude to the hot-headed pupil as the grand mogul moreover beethoven wanted to be instructed in counterpoint the hard way and he was greatly irritated when haydn did not carefully correct his technical exercises therefore though the relationship remained outwardly amicable and the lessons went on beethoven changed teachers he placed himself in the hands of the composer johann schenk and of the contrapuntalist johann albrechtsberger as schenk had told beethoven in looking over some of his technical work haydn was now too busy composing great masterworks to be occupied by the needs of a particularly obstreperous student in seventeen ninety four haydn started out a second time for london but this time not in salomon's company yet as he did not wish to make the journey unattended he decided on one of his young friends for an escort Polzelli, beethoven or some other his usual luck attended him when he picked johann elsler whose father had copied music at esterhaza johann was haydn's godson and in the fullness of time he became the father of the famous dancer fanny elsler he idolized haydn served him hand and foot was secretary copyist and the first to assist haydn in cataloguing his works on this english visit haydn travelled rather more extensively than the first time he went to the isle of wight to southampton to waverley abbey to winchester he went to hampton court which reminded him of esterhaza he heard miserable trash at the haymarket theatre and even worse at sadler's wells in bath he met a miss brown an amiable discreet person who had the additional advantage of a beautiful mother he saw the grave of turk a faithful dog and not a man and he composed music to a poem by the conductor of the bath harmonic society what art expresses in august seventeen ninety five haydn was back in vienna and although the heartbreaks of the previous return were spared him he found plenty of new organizational labor awaiting him at esterhaza where a new prince nicholas the second a grandson of the magnificent now held sway his all was another full-length oratorio the seasons based on james thompson's didactic poem here again the baron von schwieten edited and translated though he made use of several german poems in addition to thompson's of which he altered the unhappy ending the composer worked for three years on the seasons not completing it until eighteen o one it seems to have tested his power sorely it was no less optimistic a document than the creation but by and large an outspoken nature piece conceived in rousseau's back to nature philosophy yet with only transient religious undertones and without the genuinely biblical quality of the creation still the truly amazing part of the seasons is its incessant vitality the charm of its pictorial aspect and the unending freshness of its inspiration all the same the magnificent work made unmistakable inroads on haydn's vitality he paid for its success with his health and was in the habit of saying from now on the seasons has given me the death blow actually he had suffered a physical breakdown of a sort shortly after one of the productions of the creation he had to take to his bed and intermittently the flow of his inspiration threatened to halt but invariably he would recover both physically and mentally he revised his earlier seven last words as an oratorio he arranged two hundred and fifty scotch folk songs for the edinburgh publisher george thompson the number of his string quartets increased performances of the creation multiplied everywhere honors poured in upon him from all quarters he was warmly invited to come to paris and his old pupil pleyel was dispatched to fetch him fortunately haydn spared himself the exertions of such a trip still france struck a medal in his honor which gave the master no end of pleasure and he received the warmest expressions of affection from the inhabitants of the little baltic island of rügen where a performance of the creation was given he even strove to be his own publisher and sought subscriptions for the score of the oratorio 
his friends rallied magnificently to his aid the english royal family the empress of austria the innumerable friends from his native country and from britain england as much as austria now claimed him as one of her very own lord nelson and lady hamilton visited esterhaza and it is said that for two days the lady would not budge from haydn's side while nelson gave him a gold watch in exchange for the master's pen the great composition of this later period of haydn's life is beyond dispute his patriotic anthem gott erholte franz den kaiser the austrian hymn as through thick and thin it has remained that too was indirectly a product of his english experiences he had always been stirred in london by god save the all those springs of folk-song influence which were either remembered or subconsciously wrought into the fabric of his being and he was now working on a newer and larger scale than hitherto never was i so devout as when composing the creation he afterwards said i knelt down every day and prayed to god to strengthen me in my work if his inspiration ever threatened to grow sluggish, I rose from the pianoforte and began to say my rosary. This cure, he insisted, never failed. The curious aspect of the creation is that, though composed to a German translation of the English text, it is one of those rare masterpieces which actually sound better in a translation than in the original the answer to this springs probably from the circumstance that the creation is in point of fact an anglo-saxon heritage an examination of numerous details of its setting and declamation make it clear that almost subconsciously haydn has set and accompanied the english words in more subtly revealing fashion than the german similarly haydn achieved in the whole work that effect at which he was aiming writing to her daughter the princess eleanor liechtenstein said of the oratorio one has to shed tears about the greatness the majesty the goodness of god the soul is uplifted one cannot but love and admire the first performance of the creation was given at the palace of prince schwarzenberg in vienna on april twenty ninth seventeen ninety eight only invited guests attended this and the second performance though the mobs outside were so great that extra detachments of police had to be summoned haydn conducted not from a keyboard but in the modern way with a baton the rendering was superb the audience enraptured haydn himself said later one moment i was as cold as ice the next i seemed on fire more than once i was afraid i should have a stroke the creation promptly spread over the world in england it was to prove so unfailing an attraction that proceeds from it mostly given to charitable institutions by far surpassed even the receipts from the london benefit concerts that once had seemed so extraordinary to haydn in paris bonaparte was on his way to hear a performance of it when a bomb exploded in the street through which he was passing narrowly missing his carriage in america it took root in short order the score deserves in reality a much more detailed scrutiny than can be given here the introduction the representation of chaos does not receive the attention it actually merits there is a warmth of color to the writing particularly to the woodwind which is something new in haydn and the closing bars of the amazing page are the more startling because they provide a foretaste of one of the most striking passages in wagner's tristan und isolde it may be mentioned in passing that this is by no means the only time when haydn affords an amazing wagnerian presage the great and even more celebrated moment in the opening choral number of the oratorio is the passage let there be light and there was light from a thin gray c minor we are suddenly overwhelmed with a sudden and mighty c major chord an unmistakable sunburst in tone in all music this tremendous moment has not its like unless it be a similar episode also a sunrise and by curiously related means at the opening of richard strauss's thus spake zarathustra from the very first this moment in the creation overpowered the listeners and after a century and a half it has lost not a vestige of its glory 
at his last appearance in a concert hall haydn only a few weeks from his end was taken to a performance of his work at this episode the old master pointed upwards with the words not from me from there above comes everything the strain of unending toil was beginning to tell on haydn though the amazing aspect of it is that these latest works of his do not betray the slightest diminution of freshness or inventive powers yet on june twelfth seventeen ninety nine he wrote to breitkopf and hertel a letter which deserves attention my business unhappily expands with my advancing years, and it almost seems as if, with the decrease of my mental powers, my inclination and impulse to work increase. O oh God, how much yet remains to be done in this splendid art, even by a man like myself! The world indeed daily pays me many compliments, even on the fervor of my latest works, but no one can believe the strain and effort it costs me to produce them inasmuch as time after time my feeble memory and the unstrung state of my nerves so completely crush me to earth that i fall into the most melancholy condition for days afterwards i am incapable of formulating one single idea till at length my heart is revived by providence and i seat myself at the piano and begin once more to hammer away at it then all goes well again god be praised i only wish and hope that the critics may not handle my creation with too great severity and be too hard on it they may possibly find the musical orthography faulty in various passages and perhaps other things also which for many years i have been accustomed to consider as minor points but the genuine connoisseur will see the real cause as readily as i do and willingly ignore such stumbling blocks this however is entirely entre nous or i might be accused of conceit and arrogance from which however my heavenly father has preserved me all my life long haydn had still a prodigious amount of work before him chief of 